billahi minash shaytanir racim bismillahir rahmanir rahim Elhamdülillahi rabbil alamin ve salatu ve selamu ala rasulina Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve ashabihi ve etba'ihi ecma'in Rabbi şrahli sadri ve yassirli amri vahlul uqdatan min lisani yafqahu qawli Rabbi yassir ve la tu'asir Rabbi temmin bil khayr O Allah, make it easy, don't make it hard Allow whatever we, uh, allow whatever we do to be of khayr upon ourselves and upon the community around us Bismillah ta'ala Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Beloved brothers and sisters in Islam Alhamdulillah we have reached another Saturday night where we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us or allow myself to explain what should be explained and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow each and every one of you to understand what should be understood and we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us through these concepts inshallah to act upon what we know and to act upon what we know because any sort of knowledge anything that goes through this mind these ears we will be questioned about and if it does not transform into action into amal it is void it is one that it was just a waste of time now my brothers and my sisters alhamdulillah we have reached another Saturday night, a night where, and every Saturday night, we remember and we remind each and every one of you know, our friends and our brothers around us that Saturday nights are an important night. Saturday nights are a night that we are able to see the difference between haq and batil. We are able to see the difference between good and bad. And in saying that, we need to, inshallah, you know, specify and kind of bring to our attention the concept of how on a Saturday night, according to statistics, the, the most alcohol is consumed and sold on a Saturday night, on Saturday night throughout the week. The most people fall into zina on a Saturday night. The amount of people throughout the week that fall into drugs compared to a Saturday night is not even you know, thought about, it's not even spoken about. On Saturday nights, we see the reality of a Muslim and a non-Muslim. And Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen each and every one of us and has allowed us to be here on a Saturday night, to be at Guildford Mosque on a Saturday night. Now in saying that, does that mean that, you know, if we're not at Guildford Mosque, what's happening, what's the case? Of course, that's not the case, but we need to be able to understand a concept. And that is that nothing happens for no reason. If Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has allowed us to be here on tonight in specific, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there is, a play, there, there is a plan behind this. If tonight's topic specifically being about a man and due to that man we're here, know that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is teaching us something for those that understand, inshallah. Now starting off, I would like to start off with an ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and, and an ayah that we all know, we all probably have memorized better than me. An ayah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Al-Ahzab, to ayah 23, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, it's the one where the men one, you know, the one where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us who the men are. Okay? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, among the believers are men who were true to their promise to Allah. Among the believers, there are men that are true to the promise that they've given to Allah. Some of them have fulfilled their promise, in brackets, by dying, 
And some of them are still waiting. And at the end, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and they have not changed in the least. They're still working hard and waiting for that moment. Now, in this ayah, we need to first be able to unpack this ayah before this whole series. Because Alhamdulillah, we are starting a series called Leaders of the Ummah series. This, you know, Leaders of the Ummah series, for some of us, might come as something strange. It might come to us as, why are we going through random individuals, random people that are on this poster, when we have the best of examples, Rasulullah wasalam. Why is there any kalam? Why is there any speech other than the speech of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? But in saying that, we need to be able to understand this ayah and inshallah be able to understand the example I'm going to give. And that's going to allow us to understand this five week series that we are inshallah embarking on, this journey that we're embarking on. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in this ayah explains to us that there is believers, Muslims, but in and amongst them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes a specific category and says that there are men amongst the believers. Not everyone, not every believer is a man or a woman, but amongst them there are men and women. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives the prerequisite for a man and a woman. Doesn't matter what age, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't specify age. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala specifies an action, a concept. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, they are those that keep their promise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In saying this, in talking about keeping your promise to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it is without a doubt the promise of Worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in saying that, at the beginning of the lecture, we did say that any knowledge that does not transform into action, that does not transform into amal, that does not get these limbs into action, is void. And hence, there was the second kind of category that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala opens up and says, and there are those other people that are still living and inshallah they have not changed at all. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be of those that are classified as a man and a woman according to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and in accordance to that as Allah says they have not changed the least. In saying that and before we get into our lecture for tonight just inshallah trying to unpack the concept of the leaders of the Ummah series. It's one of a kind, we have to say that. It's probably the first of ever kind of a series that I've ever heard in Australia. A series where, and Jimmy's like, no, it's not, but <laughs> a series where, especially in regards to these individuals, because, you know, if you've seen the poster, there are, you know, individuals from Bosnia, individuals from Turkey, from all different parts of the world. But I have to say there's one thing in specific, one thing that brings them all together. And we'll speak about that inshallah throughout the lecture. Before I continue on about the le uh, leaders of the Ummah series, let's think about a slingshot. Now when we're thinking about and imagining a slingshot, we need to be able to inshallah bring to our minds that, you know, a slingshot, you know, I'll show it with my hand for those that don't know. You know, you'll have kind of the sling, or the sling is mainly the thing, and just those two barks or two kind of wooden pieces. And however further you would like to send this, you know, rock or whatever you would like to do, whatever you would like to send the other way, you need to be able to pull this. However back you pull it, that's how far this shot will go. And in saying that, we need to be able to understand that the individuals that we are going through tonight and for the next four weeks have all passed away. A lot of them, about 
you know, 10, 20, some 40 years ago. So not too long ago. And the concept of this is this. In order for us to reach long distances in regards to our Iman, in regards to our Deen, and in being in Australia, for us to be reaching higher ideals, higher ideals, bigger aims, we need to be able to go that much back. And according to that slingshot example, we need to be able to come so much back that however forward we would like to go. And in saying that, we're not going too far back with you know, tonight's uh, individual, tonight's leader. But inshallah, for the weeks to come, the other four weeks, there are going to be some individuals that I'm sure, I'm sure, I'm sure some of you don't even know about. A lot of our brothers have already mentioned that they don't know about the individual that we're going to go through tonight. So it's a good step because we're only going back about 10, 15 years. And hence, inshallah, with the examples, with the sayings, the quotes, and the stories that we're going to go through, I'm sure each and every one of us is going to be able to see it in our own lives. And that's the concept. What did we say at the beginning? We said that any ilm that is taught, any ilm that is going through this body needs to transform into action. And after tonight and for the next four weeks, one thing that we should not be hearing from any brother and any sister is this. It's that, you know, I don't know of any role model. I don't know of anyone that has lived in a time like me. Tonight we are breaking that concept. Tonight we are bringing to you, and for the next four weeks, we are bringing to you individuals that are going to be able to make you realize what we need to do from today on. And it's going to be easy. We're going to make it so easy that inshallah, you're just going to listen and be like, the next step is this. Inshallah, that's our intention. Now in saying that, we'll uh, inshallah begin. Um, but I have to also give another disclaimer that throughout the five weeks, the leaders of the Ummah series, for the next five or four weeks, including tonight, one thing that I would like everyone to understand is this. Of course, we're going to go through the founder of ICMG. But that is only one individual out of the five people that we've put on that poster. And why I'm saying this is this. It's that our concept, we're not stuck on individuals. We won't, and we learned this from the Sahaba, we won't even stuck with Rasulullah salatu wasalam. Because when Rasulullah passed away, we heard the saying that Islam is still continuing. And hence, we're not stuck on the individuals. And the people that we have put on there, they're not necessarily, you know, in regards to being from ICMG. They're not from ICMG alone. Out of all of them, probably one of them. But the concept, the ideals, the motivation, was all the same. And it was all linking back to something. And that was gaining the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And in saying that, inshallah, we'll begin. And the brothers are like, man, subhanAllah, you're just beginning. Inshallah, we'll begin bi It won't be a long one, inshallah, we're praying that it won't. Um, but before I continue, <laughs> but before we uh, continue, I would just like to mention uh, in regards to this individual that I'm going to be speaking about tonight, well, uh, there's so much information that, man, you know, in order to actually, you know, unpack his life, a couple of years maybe. Like, I personally, I don't think I can do it. And uh, going through it, I was like, subhanAllah, you know, the individual that was given to me was a, was a hard one, I have to say. But inshallah, we're going to try our best to, inshallah, be able to... Um, explain his life, but of course the main point isn't to explain you know, his life, but rather to uh, get messages out of his life, inshallah. Now the individual that we're going to be speaking about tonight, 
He was a man of unwavering faith. He was a man that was a symbol of dedication. He was a man that was a beacon that was radiating grace. He was a man that stood tall and strong for justice. He was a man that had conviction and wisdom. He was a man of wisdom and vision. He was a man who nurtured the seeds of unity in the Ummah and all parts of the world. He was a man that had determination. He was a man whose legacy still prevails today. He was a man that was a leader who paved the way for Muslims. He was a man that was guided by the Quran and Sunnah. And especially after the fall of the Ottomans, he was a man that taught the Muslims that we are powerful. We have power. And this individual that we're going to inshallah speak about tonight, as you have probably seen on the poster, which is linking up to you know, bring about some excitement to this man. This man's passed away. And we you know, testify that inshallah, he is accordance, he lived a life in accordance to this aim about the man, the men. The man that we're going to be speaking about tonight is Professor Nejmeddin Arbakan. This man was a man that earned the title Mujahid. He earned that title. And after the time when he earned that title, all of his, you know, protests, all of his meetings, whatever, people would call him by the name of Mujahid Arbakan. Mujahid Arbakan. And, you know, um, I have to, inshallah, you know, uh, go back and explain this one. I was in uh, Malaysia for, um, I was doing, uh, so I was handing out Qurban. So I went there with Hasene, uh, a certain amount of years ago, I can't remember when I went, but um, we went to uh, so many different villages in Malaysia, okay, to the borders and and it was very hard for some individuals, but uh, we met so many people, so interestingly, so many people um, that turned around to you and you're, you're trying to explain your organization. Hassan, you're trying to explain ICMG, they don't understand. And then you tell them, Nejmeddin, they still, you know, to an extent, and then you tell them, Mujahid Arbaka, and the guy all of a sudden is like, yes, the leader of the Muslims. Literally, I've experienced this myself. To the extent, and I still have the contact of the brother, uh, we jumped into a car, we work with this different organization when we're there, it's called Mapim, um, and we hopped into his car, we're going to a, an orphanage. And on the way there, I'm like to him, you know, what's your name? We're trying to talk to the driver. He goes, my name is Nejmuddin. And I'm like to him, SubhanAllah, I go like, brother, like why did your parents name you this, you know? He goes, what do you mean, brother? Nejmuddin Arbakan. He goes, don't you know him? And then he started teaching me, I learned a lot, but he started to teach me who Nejmeddin Arbakan is, a Malaysian. Now, we're going to find out and know that Nejmeddin Arbakan was someone born in Turkey. In a time when not necessarily did we have TikTok, in a time when not necessarily did we have Instagram, okay? We did have internet, but we necessarily didn't have many of the other uh, medias. But how does an individual name their son Nejmuddin, Nejmuddin, in accordance to Mujahid al -Wakan. So this individual has done something for the Ummah that allowed for parents to hope that their sons are similar to this Mujahid al -Wakan. And that's what we're going to try to unpack inshallah tonight. Now, you know, talking about the life of Nejmeddin Arbakan, Professor Nejmeddin Arbakan. You know, let's go through what Google first says, and then inshallah we'll uh, you know, unpack his life, and then we'll go through some of his uh, quotes, and inshallah we'll end it 
of like that. So Necmet in Erbakan, Professor Necmet in Erbakan was born in Sinop in Turkey. Uh, he obtained his engineering degree uh, in a university in Istanbul and pursued his postgraduate studies in Germany and Switzerland. Professor Adabakan was a, and this is literally, and this is Google, says that he was a distinguished Islamic scholar. And when you look at his life, you don't necessarily, you don't necessarily see that scholar aspect in his life. But in his works, you understand that there is wisdom. There is something that was above that concept of just being a politician. Just being a leader of a party or just being a leader of an organization. Nejmetin Arbakan Mujahid Arbakan's contributions spanned various fields, including academia, politics, and social activism. He played an important role in the establishment of various Islamic organizations. And, uh, you know, in saying that, we need to mention. You know, ICMG, IGMG, there's many other, but inshallah we'll name a couple of them. IHH, IHA, um, you know, Jansuyu, there's so many other that's in Turkey. And I have to make mention of this. When you go to Turkey, when you go to Turkey and you speak to individuals, if they are people that are a bit older, okay, they're people that aren't necessarily, or they're older than the 30 to maybe older than the 40 mark and they are strong Muslims that had a concern. You speak to individuals like this in Turkey, you are sure to know that that individual will be a part of an organization that yes, Nejmetin Arabakan formed or yes, Nejmetin Arabakan had an impact on. A hundred percent. And you see this throughout Australia as well, where individuals come and you speak to them and you know you realize that yes, Nejmet Dinara can also have an impact on this individual, that individual. And you'll be able to realize that throughout even, even politics as well. Moving forward, he played an important role, as we said, for many different organizations, but many different parties as well. And then, you know, moving on from there, he had an impact on the Muslim community, etc. Now, Inshallah, I just want to very, you know, quickly skim through his um, biography, he skimmed through his timeline. Uh, Nejmetin Arabakan was someone that was born in 1926. He was someone that, you know, went to uh, Istanbul University in 1944. And then sometime later, after he graduated, he went to, uh, as we said, Germany and Switzerland in 1953. This individual was someone that actually finished his university degree and even his postgraduate degrees to an extent two to three years earlier than his, you know, classmates due to his brain, due to this concept or this thing of him being smart. Okay. And of course, being smart isn't necessarily something that um, you get without studying. You need to be able to, inshallah, put your mind on something, be determined about something, have a concern about something. And yes, Nejmet Din Al-Bakhan did. And we move on. He was someone that formed many different parties. One of them, one of the first ones that he formed was Milli Nizam Partisi, which was the National Order Party. Okay. And then, of course, sometime later, that got shut down due, by the uh, Turkish government due to, you know, the usual, um, you know, it was too Islamist. It was too jihadist. And it got closed down. After some time, he opened up the Refah Party, the Welfare Party. And in between, there are so many other kind of things that he's opened up, but just skimming through it. And then sometime later, the Refah Party also, you know, was forced to close. And then sometime later, he formed Saadet Party. And then, um, yeah, and until today, uh, we see it surviving to an extent. And of course, in the year 2011, Professor Nejmetin Arbakan passed away uh, on February 27 in um, Ankara, in Turkey. Um, and of course, till now, we see a 
everlasting legacy of what he has done, and etc., and etc., inshallah. But we're going to go through it. You know, reflecting on his life and, you know, kind of um, trying to unpack his life, we see that he was an individual that even though his parties were closed down, even though his organizations were closed down, even though, and even today we experience this, uh, in Germany today, today, Germany, um, uh, the brothers that are a part of the IGMG, okay, ICMG, in Germany, if you have or if you had any affiliation, and this is first-hand experience uh, or first-hand hearing this from individuals there, um, uh, if you have any affiliation with Nejmet in Arbaka, they don't actually give you citizenship of Germany, okay? They cut your kind of that concept of dual citizens, citizenship in Germany. At the same time, with this concept, um, I need to make mention of, and inshallah, maybe we'll send him and we'll make to offer him as well, uh, our brother Sechuk Chichek. So this brother, he works at the headquarters, a very close brother that um, I have to myself. Uh, and he explained to me years back, I was in Turkey studying, and he was like to me, he goes, I at the moment, he was a history teacher at that time. He goes, I at the moment can't work as a history teacher just because my name was on the membership list of Arba Kamaj's party. And he goes, now today I can't work in Germany, anywhere in Germany, um, as anything, let alone being a history teacher. And hence the organization gave him a job and etc. But, you know, the, this is what we can see, even though he's passed away, the effects are still continuing. The legacy is still continuing. And this is something that when I was speaking to this brother, um, Serge Garbin, it's something that he was proud about. It was something that he was saying, yes, I am a part of you know, the organization of Alba Kamaja. Even though it had a big effect on his and his family's life. In saying that, you know, throughout the life of Professor Nejmet in Arbakan, we see that he follows the commandments of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the commandments of Rasulullah In the first one, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Hud, Ayah 88, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says and gives us the saying of Shu'ayb alayhi salam. He says, My Lord, my Creator, enable me to be grateful for your favor which you have bestowed upon me. And throughout the life of Professor Nejmet in Arbakan, we see him returning back or trying to pay to an extent, not that we are going to be able to, the favors of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Because for a believer, even praying is that concept of saying, Ya Allah, Alhamdulillah. And moving on, Rasulullah says, the best of people are those who bring most benefit to others. And yes, throughout the life of Nejman Din Arbakan, we've seen benefit. Even though he's passed away, we still see the effect in and amongst us. Now, moving on, inshallah, I would like to, so I, you know, just inshallah skim through his life. Be able to, inshallah, now look into some of his uh, different quotes and inshallah, through his quotes, be able to understand who this individual is and was. Okay. Nejmet Din Arbaka was and is an individual that, again, we believe every single one of us should take as a role model. Passing away in 2011 and up until the last day he passed away, he followed the Sunnah and that was, he did not stop fighting, he did not stop doing Jihad. And what we mean by that is, even on the deathbed, thinking about where his party is going, where his organization is going, was something that was heard from Nejmet Din Now looking into his Inshallah quotes, And uh, the reason why we put his quotes, the reason why I put his quotes, 
is so that we see who this individual is, who this man is. Now, the first quote of him, and we'll read it because it's, it's Turkish, so we'll read it in Turkish and inshallah we'll translate it. Um, may Allah make it easy for those that, the brothers that are going to come the weeks after, so for the Bosnian, etc. leaders. Um, it might be a bit hard for them to translate, as easy as I'm going to inshallah translate. Um, so the first quote that um, I put is, he says, Bir milletin asıl gücü topu tüfeği yahut tankı değil, imanlı ve inançlı genç değildir. So the main power that a ummah, we'll translate it into ummah, that a people have is not necessarily their tanks, their guns, but rather it is the youth that are filled with Iman. And we saw this throughout the history of Islam and even today. Moving on, Professor Necmettin Erbakan says, Haksız bir davada zirve olmaktansa, hak davada zerre olmayı tercih ederim. Professor Dr. Necmettin Erbakan teaches us a concept that instead of being the highest position or to have the highest post in a da'wah that is batal, in a da'wah that is wrong, I would rather have the smallest, the lowest role in a da'wah that is haq. And we've seen this throughout his life. And we too need to apply this into our lives. That whatever role is given to us, it might seem as something wrong, it might seem as something small, but we need to know if it's on the path to haq, if it's on the path to serving Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then you know what? Let it be. Moving on, Nejmetin Arbakan says, Malila Janila Jihad Eden Bir Musliman Olarak Anilmak Istedim. I would like to be, you know, remembered as an individual that was doing jihad with his earnings and with his life. And yes, alhamdulillah, the dua that he had, we remember it today. And we know that, and at the beginning of it, I personally am a witness to the, you know, jihad that Nejmetin Arbakan has done. Moving on, he says, and this one's an interesting one. I'll just quickly translate it without reading the Turkish. We won't flex my uh, awesome Turkishness. But um, he says that Muslims that do not care about politics will be governed by politicians that don't care about Muslims. Muslims that do not care about politics will be governed by politicians that do not care about Muslims. My brothers and my sisters, now, for years and years, we've always been told that politics is something that we need to stay away from. And you know what, Sah? I agree. To an extent, we need to pull away from politics. But in today's, you know, circumstance, and even throughout the, you know, elections that we just overcame in Turkey, we saw one thing that the non-Muslim, uh, the, the, the non-Turkish Muslims started to get up and aware people, you know, warn people against the tide that, that is coming. And we then realized that yes, you know, even though we are against that concept of politics and we're only for Sharia in today's system, especially in, you know, if we're looking at Australia, if we're looking at you know, Turkey, etc. We need to be able to understand that. Play it for the time. Play it by the books. And hence, if we are to act like we don't care about the politics of our council, if we act like we don't care about the politics of our, you know, states, of our country, know that, and that's what we're experiencing today with the LGBT and etc. We're literally experiencing that. You know, we didn't care about if Labour or Liberal is coming into power. We didn't care about it to an extent. Some of us didn't even vote and etc. But then we came to the reality that yes, right now, 
we're getting policies that are being you know, thrown at us in regards to LGBT and whatever they are, that we're actually, we can't actually say no to. We can't actually stop. Even to the extent of, and mark the words here, that sooner or later they're going to come into Muslim schools in with this concept. And why is all of this happening to an extent? It's because there are Muslims that turn, don't care about what's around them, and hence there are people around them that don't care about them. Moving on, he says, Iman varsa imkan da vardır. I said I'm not going to flex, but I did again. But um, he says that if there is Iman, there is imkan. If there is Iman, there is always possibilities. There is always that power to, for anything to be done. And then he explains, as someone that is a part of Milli Gurush, someone that is a part of ICMG, must never ever give up. And he's shown us this, and we've, we inshallah need to apply this as well. Moving on, he says, Everything starts by just dreaming. And he had a dream. Professor Nejmetin Arbakan had a dream. And his dream was, and we saw, we saw this throughout all of his talks, his dream was to have a new world. A world where there is justice. To have a world where there are no one, not only Muslims, but there are no one, experiencing injustice in any sort and inshallah i'm going to explain a story of him of how he applied this in his life i'll actually explain it here so that i don't explain the other story and it all gets mixed up professor nejment in arbakan what was i going to explain ah yes he says Professor Nejmet Dinar Bakan was an individual that had a dream. His dream was to allow for no one to experience injustice. And you know what he done? He looked that in Turkey to an extent, in Turkey they are able to achieve this. This concept of being able to bring justice to Turkey. He tried and to an extent they were achieving it. And then he realized that, you know what, around the world, we need to bring this concept of justice. And then he formed this concept, this group that is called the D8, the Developing Eight Countries. Now the D8 was and is till today something that brought eight Muslim countries together on the same table and were able to make a collective decision. Now, in regards to the D8, we saw and inshallah pray that we're going to see many more actions. And what were some of the actions? When a Muslim was to experience some sort of hardship, the developing eight countries, the eight Muslim countries, which had Pakistan in it, etc. And they all, I'll tell you this, in and amongst them, there were countries that not necessarily maybe even fell into the category of, you know, being with the same Islamic mindset as Turkey. But as a Muslim, he was beyond this. As going against justice was beyond this. And hence, they were able to form a place, at least a, you know, a, a, a table that had a collective decision, that had a collective action. And there are, of course, many things that they achieved, which, inshallah, you, you guys can search into. The next one that I would like to look at is... He explains that we need to be like the butterflies that have an effect on the wind. And um, on the wind. And this quote actually comes about from, and I actually just realized this. I knew that there was this concept, but I kind of read into it just now, just throughout this, um, uh, you know, preparing for this lecture. He explains and if you guys have ever seen our zakah and fitra um, posters of Hasana, we constantly have this concept of a butterfly. And we always talk about a butterfly effect. Not this year's one, but the year before, etc. 
We always spoke about a butter butterfly effect. And if you are to punch into Google butterfly effect, you'll be able to realize what Nejmet Din Erbakan was talking about. The butterfly effect that Nejmet Din Erbakan spoke about back years ago, and he said this quote that we need to be like the butterfly that can transform wind. He explains a time when, and apparently he was in Australia years back, when there was a hurricane. And this hurricane was going through Australia, moving towards the inner Asia. And he says, the, you know, after coming to the seas, they realize that the hurricane kind of disappears to an extent or moves to a different direction. And of course, the scientists, etc., look into this. And you'll be able to look into it as well, inshallah. He says, the scientists look into this and they try to find out what happened that affected the direction of this hurricane. And they look into the concept of the butterfly, butterfly effect. And they realize that when it was on its journey towards Asia, there was a certain amount of butterflies that were migrating. And on their route to migration or in their you know, way, they come across this hurricane. No intention, just the last plan. And that butterfly effect, a group of butterflies changed or transformed the direction of a massive hurricane, a massive wind. And the Ejment in Arabakan telling us that we need to be like those butterflies was this. It was that even though there are going to be hurricanes around us, LGBTQ, etc. Even though there are going to be winds that come strong to us, you know, atheism, etc. Even though there are going to be winds that hit us hard in regards to drugs and alcohol, we need to have that butterfly effect. That concept of being together and transforming the direction, transforming that, you know, that big tide that is coming our way. And moving on, Nejmetin Arbakan, he says, and he explained, and we need to inshallah touch base on this, touch up upon this. He explained to the Muslims who the Zionists are. He explains who the Zionists are. And you know, up until the time when Nejmetin Arbakan explained Zionism, no one knew Zionism to an extent. There was the concept of Zionism, but not many people were speaking about it. And this individual from Turkey brought about the concept of Zionism. He explained the concept of Zionism and how it was very different to Judaism. It was very different to the Jewish nation and etc. and etc. And again, we won't be able to touch up upon it. You need to inshallah look into it. He explains that the, the individuals that are, or the body that is bringing about injustice in the world, the brain of it is Zionism. The heart of it is Europe and in whatever, wherever they are, the countries that are in it as well. The right arm of it is America and the left arm is Russia. And without a doubt, my brothers and my sisters, inshallah, it's not being recorded, but like, as in that one's only, it's not online. Uh, <laughs> uh, without a doubt, my brothers and my sisters, we see this even today. Zionism is in and amongst us. And please, if you have the time to do so, and if this lecture doesn't you know, fly past your head, please, please, please research about this and be able to comprehend and understand where this dunya is going and who actually is calling the shots and etc etc um, and then he explains that and we'll move on from this one as well he says he explains how islam it's all about and is the 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 concept of justice and being the best way of life and then he explains that every single Muslim is someone that needs to be a, 
uh, 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 you know, an, uh, an individual that races and allows for others to race for khair and is, a, is someone that can, you know, break and stop what is shar. And then he explains that, um, he says, if being a Muslim was just to pray, do adhkar, to read Quran, and etc. and etc., then what was Abu Ayyub al Ansari doing in Istanbul? And in this concept, we need to explain this, inshallah. You know, we need to understand that Abu Ayyub al Ansari was someone that was in and amongst Saudi Arabia. And he hears about the concept of Constantinople and how it needs to be conquered, Istanbul, and how it needs to be conquered. And Abu Ayyub al Ansari goes on a long journey. This old man, past the age of 50, some narrations say, goes on a long journey to Istanbul, you know, he's walking, etc. And uh, of course, after that long journey, he reaches Istanbul to see that Istanbul is already conquered. And, um, and then, of course, now we see a place that's under his name, Ayyub. And he's um, actually buried there. Uh, Nejmet Din Arbakan brings to our attention that, you know, whoever tells us that, you know, Islam is only, and if you are to do this, it's done. The concept of, you know, praying, you know, doing adhkar, reading Quran, which is the pinnacle, the most important kind of concepts of our deen. But then there is the concept that, as we said at the beginning, that needs to transform into action, that needs to transform into amal. And that's what Abu Ayyub al-Ansari taught us, the concept of action, the concept of jihad. And finishing up, inshallah, this is the last, inshallah, place we'll, uh, we'll make mention of. And this was one of his last uh, sayings that he used to always mention. And um, after all, a lot of his you know, uh, talks and stuff, he would say, um, we, every one of us needs motivation, motivation, motivation. And he says, you know why we need motivation? He says, to help and assist. And he explains a story of an African child or an African kid that the soldiers, they're on this truck and they've got food on the truck. And what they do is, and there was a video back then that he plays as well. He says, on this truck, this kid, there's kids that are running from, to, to this truck to grab some bread. And these soldiers that are on these trucks, we're not going to, inshallah, we won't mention which country's soldiers they are. You guys can research, inshallah. Because we're not pinpointing targets. The target is Batal, whoever they are. And we need to be a part of Haq, whoever they are. Um, and he says, you know why we need motivation? You know why we need to act? You know why we need to show some sort of you know, initiative for this child that is running after that truck? just for one loaf of bread. And you know how those soldiers that aren't giving it, they're just allowing the truck to drive and run, you know, kind of make a game with the kid. A game that the kid has hope that he's going to reach this bread, but not necessarily are these soldiers going to give it. He says, we need motivation to fix that, to be of assistance to that child, that African child, etc., etc. Throughout the life of Nejmet and Arabakan, we saw the concept of initiating justice, and I use the word initiating because, yes, brothers and sisters, we need some sort of initiation. You know, in today's day and age, we're not seeing the concept of amal, the concept of action in our lives, unfortunately. And in saying that, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to you know, allow us to act, allow us to be able to, inshallah, change certain things in our lives and in the lives of the other people around us, bi'idhnillah. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant Najmat in Arbakan and all of our leaders, all of our Muslim leaders, Firdaus uh, al-A'la. And, uh, and we ask Allah to allow us to inshallah follow the footsteps and be able to realize who the real enemy is and be able to realize who the real uh, friend is, bi'idhnillah. Wa akhir dawana anilhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. الفاتحة